Okay, and now for some reason, this doesn't want to show the picture, but I'm just going to introduce Peter. There it is. Peter Russell is Curator Emeritus of the Earth Sciences Museum at the University of Waterloo, where he continues to work on a volunteer basis. The university designated him an honorary member of UW in 1999 for his work in public awareness of science, for which he also received the 2004 Geological Association of Canada Earl Neal Award. In 2012, he received the Lieutenant Governors of Ontario's Heritage Award for Lifetime Achievement. This award recognizes individuals who have made volunteer contributions to preserving, protecting, and promoting community heritage over a period of 25 years or more. Peter received the Ontario Groundwater Association 2017 Earth, Wind, Fire, and Water Award. That award is presented annually to a group or individual who has demonstrated their commitment to and excellence in protecting the quality and use of one of Earth's most precious commodities, groundwater. And so I will now hand it over to Peter. Thank you. Okay. Oops. Yeah, I'm just got it. Okay. There we go. Good evening. Um, Shirley's box, the Highgate Mastodon story. We start off uh, with a few other mastodons and mammoths and make our way to the Highgate one. Um, I started working on this project with Paul Caro, who a professor at the University of Waterloo, and he was a member of Waterloo Nature for many years. Um, Paul was a, a, uh, interested in uh, mammoths, mastodons, uh, glacial features, all that kind of thing. Uh, you'll notice John Hoganson is on this list, and he uh, was the uh, North Dakota paleontologist who helped put together the Highgate Mastodon skeleton in Bismarck, North Dakota. Uh, Karina McDonald is uh, the curator of the Earth Sciences Museum and works on a number of projects to do with this. And Hank, uh, he uh, was a relative of one of the people in the story. So I'll tell you when Hank shows up in the story. Some of you may recognize this Reitman's catalog um, picture. I don't think they're giving out catalogs anymore. This was winter 2006. And the young lady there is standing with uh, a mastodon at the Museum of Nature in, in Ottawa. Southern Ontario, we've had lots to do with elephants one way or the other. Uh, Jumbo, the elephant, went, visited St. Thomas and um, it was taken there by train and got off the train. And a train, another train was coming into town and a smaller elephant was in the way of that uh, train coming in. So Jumbo pushed the other elephant out of the way, but it kind of uh, got killed. Um, Jumbo was um, originally part of uh, the elephants in, in England, uh, and eventually P.T. Barnum purchased it and brought it over to North America. If you look at how many kids are on the back of that elephant, I think it's a little bit exaggerated. Here is uh, Jumbo, who was killed in St. Thomas, September the 15th, 1885. And um, they, uh, they, they made two specimens out of the, of the creature. They made uh, the skeleton, and uh, the, uh, the skin. Uh, not many pieces were left after a hundred years. I think one of them was burnt down, the museum that it was housed in burnt down, so that didn't help very much. Here is a skeleton of a mammoth standing nice and straight. 
press the wrong button. Um, I want to show you the difference between a mammoth and a mastodon. So uh, this is what a mammoth looks like. It looks and its um, teeth are much more, much like a, an elephant's tooth. So it has layers of dentine and enamel, dentine and enamel, um, and just as the same as a, a regular elephant. But a mastodon is different. A mastodon, if you look closely at the lower jaw, it seems to have a cigarette sticking out of the end of its jaw. That isn't a cigarette, it is a lower jaw tusk. And uh, the lower jaw tusks, um, they lasted until the mid thirties or something like that for a mastodon. And then they fell out and the hole where it was healed over. This is another a view of a mastodon. They were more um, sturdy than a, mouth, a, a mammoth. And uh, the teeth were pointed. And uh, the teeth were able to break off branches of spruce trees. And that's what they used to eat, spruce trees. Here's a mammoth tooth and a mastodon tooth showing the difference between the two. Here's one with the hand at the back of the throat of the mastodon and the new teeth come in at the back and they, and they move forward, getting worn out towards the front. And as they wear out, they fall out. After you've had about six um, sets of teeth, um, you have to go to the dentist and get some new ones. Well, in those days, they didn't have any dentist to do that. So. So you, you get uh, very worn out teeth and uh, the, the newer ones at the back. These days uh, we have found frozen mammoths uh, in Siberia, in the deep frozen in the permafrost. And here, this is a young one that was found in July, 2007. Here's a big one from Greece also that year. And the tusks were about five meters long, huge. The mammoths and mastodons, uh, if they got um, trapped on an island or something somewhere like that, where there wasn't much food, they would adapt their uh, living standards to the food available. And you'd end up with a mini mammoth like this one on the island of Crete. Mastodons used, the males used to get very upset and uh, battle with each other, um, poking the tusks into the mouth of the other one and trying to push up on the palate on the inside of the mouth. And this put some strain on the, uh, on the tusks. Uh, and that's what those little red marks are pointing at. This is a, a a picture of part of the peninsula in Michigan showing where mammoths and mastodons have been found. They're very common over there. And the dashed line was the, um, the place where the Paleo-Indians lived there up to that line. And it isn't the Mason-Dixon line, it's the Mason-Quimby line. Mason and Quimby uh, drew this line across the country and be, they, the uh, Paleo Indians were not found north of that line. Uh, the mammoths are the yellow dots, the mastodons are the red dots, red triangles, and the purple ones are, I don't know whether it's a mammoth or a mastodon. We had a similar map in Southern Ontario. Um, the, the mastodons seem to line up along the 401. So I don't know why that is, but uh, there are dune, sand dunes and things like that. Maybe that helped. Uh, we didn't have many mass, mammoths, but mostly mastodons. North of Kitchener Waterloo, uh, more mm, mammoths. And of course, the, the uh, abundance would depend on whether the food items were there. Uh, I, 
the mastodons like to eat spruce trees, so you've got to have um, uh, swampy areas with spruce trees growing, and uh, the mammoths were into grasses and things like that. This is a map showing North America, not too much of Canada, uh, but the, where all the mammoths and mastodons lived. You'll notice um, the mastodons used to really enjoy going to Florida. These are two uh, maps uh, showing where uh, mammoths and mastodons and things like that have been found. We worked on um, the one in Southern Ontario with that, uh, with all the little uh, points sticking in there. We, we found, oh, we had a student worked for us for a summer and she found out how many uh, museums had mammoth and mastodon uh, specimens and uh, was able to put them together. Over uh, 90 uh, mastod mammoths, uh, sorry, mastodons and about 30 mammoths were found. Um, it's interesting that we found a couple way up in Northern Ontario, those two white pins up there. Another gentleman put together all the pins going right out into the sea off the east coast of North America. So if you're a mammoth and a mastodon would be like a modern elephant spending 16 to 18 hours a day either feeding or moving towards a source of food or water. Consume between 60 and 300 kilograms of food each day. Drink between 60 and 160 liters of water per day and produce between 140 and 180 kilograms of droppings per day. Uh, the Thomas Jefferson fossil collection. Okay, Thomas Jefferson was a, um, a pre uh, president of the Univ U United States, and he was also a naturalist. And he got interested in mastodons when they were found um, in, in the Hudson Valley uh, and places nearby. This is the Newburgh, New York um, state um, digging when they were digging out mammoth mast mastodon pieces there. It, they had to pump the water out and uh, that is the pump, that interesting thing there. I think somebody had to walk on that uh, big circular thing to, to pump the water out. In the um, White House, uh, they, they had a display in the East Room. It was the East Room or Bone Room or Mastodon Room. And the Mastodon they had was from Ulster County, New York. Uh, they, they made a little poem about uh, President Jefferson, go wretch and resign thy presidential chair to close thy secret measures foul and fair, go search with curious eye for horned frogs, make the wild Louisiana and bogs, or where the Ohio rolls its turpid stream, dig for huge bones thy glory and scheme. Well, uh, they, they had these bones from the Mastodon and luckily, President Jefferson loaned half the bones to France. Uh, the reason that that was lucky is because the, the Brits were coming and they burnt the White House down uh, along with the, his specimens uh, of that um, mastodon. Here's another New York State Mastodon, the Hyde Park Mastodon. Maybe you've seen the Hyde Park Mastodon going by when you go past the U-Haul truck and it has this on the side of it. Um, this is the Hyde Park Mastodon uh, dig. 
so there was a on a, on the in a in the garden of a house there was a small pond <coughs> and the owner wanted to make a larger pond so they started to dig and then they found all these bones so they brought in a paleontological research institute and cornell department of geological sciences and they dug them all up this is after the dig and um, they got professors from different places like Paul Carroll went and had a look from Waterloo and uh, collected samples of the material around the, around the bones because that helps you figure out what it was like when the things were, were, were preserved. And then after all that was done, they, they got together and they chatted about it and had lunch. And then the bones were put together in a museum and that big glassed in building at the end is just for the, for the mastodon and other paleont paleontological specimens. There is the skeleton and people for scale. Hiscott site in New York also was interesting. Um, it, it had a number of uh, mammoths and mastodons found there and every year they had to open it up and put wooden planks down and they only had a, a, about a meter thickness of material before they ended up with rocks and gravel at the bottom and you can, the people at the end of this trench are working on extracting uh, bones and teeth. Um, this is what it looks like. You have to scrape right down to, to the bones. Uh, you can see sets of teeth um, at the top and uh, middle of this picture in the black stuff. Those are the teeth of these mastodons. Some of you may have been lucky to go to La Bia Tarpets in Los Angeles and I took a group of students one year there and um, the mammoths uh, and mastodons used to walk, you, they were interested in places where you could get salt and the seeps where you get oil would also have salt there so they would wander onto this um, tarry material and uh, they get stuck and as the day cooled then they would get, get uh, stuck even more into the tar. The things like saber-toothed tigers that were interested in having something for lunch looking at that uh, mammoth or mastodon stuck in the in the tar they would go after them and they get stuck too so it uh, you know, we have quite a lot of evidence of that in, at the tar pits. Okay, Shirley's box. It was a sweltering summer of 2005 and in the attic, the attic was hot, too hot for the job Shirley Fenton was doing. She was helping to prepare her family home in High, Highgate, Mass, Highgate, Ontario for sale and her task was to clean out the attic. She had been diligent toiling for days in the stuffy attic to sort through years of accumulated family treasures and the job was almost done. And she found at the back of the, the attic, a Western's biscuit box. And inside the Western biscuit box were some bones uh, wrapped up in newspaper. So she opened up a couple of them and found bones. She didn't know what they were, but she thought she knew that perhaps Peter Russell could help with that. So she put them in the back of the car and then she didn't remember about them until that winter. And uh, she gave me a call and said, uh, I've got these uh, bones in a box. Would you like to come over and have a look? So I said, certainly. Shirley Fenton uh, is a good friend going back many years and she worked as a student with Paul Carroll. Here's Shirley 
and uh, she's holding one of the teeth that was found in the box. I went over to her office and we opened up the box and she had a series of teeth and a lower jaw tusk of a mastodon. So I said, where are they from? So she said, well, they're from Highgate, Ontario. And I said, I don't know where Highgate is. So she quickly got onto, onto her computer and she showed me a map where it was. This is the Western's biscuit box. And inside it, there's some newspaper. And that kind of gave us a thought, uh, gave us a clue as to when the bones were put in the box. Fraternity grows in the time of stress. So it talks about um, the dirty 30s, you know, uh, people were out of work and things like that. So that gave us a, a clue when they, they were wrapped up and put into the attic. Uh, this shows um, a back tooth, nice and fresh, not worn, and the tusk, the lower jaw tusk. You'll notice, notice there are black lines going across the tusk and they are yearly growth rings. Uh, on an elephant or a mammoth or mastodon tusk, uh, they're like uh, a whole bunch of ice cream cones sort of stacked on top of each other. And the winter um, part of the tusk is black or brown and the lighter parts for the spring, summer and fall uh, are, are larger, um, but they're, and you can tell which they are. So here is the lower jaw tusk. You can tell when winter was, spring, summer, fall, and just count them up. The trouble with doing that, you can't really tell how old it is because the end of the tusk was getting worn in use all the time. So, so where did these things come from? So uh, Shirley showed me this map and she pointed out where Highgate is. And you can see there's a place called Fenton Road and that's where, um, that's where she lived and uh, Highgate looks something like this. And this was a family homestead in Highgate. The, when they moved off the farm into town, this is the house that they moved to. And they, that's the attic where the bones were found, the teeth were, about, were found. Here's the Orford and Highgate Agricultural Society uh, field and once a year they have an agricultural fair there. In 1890, uh, one of Shirley's relatives, sorry, some of the Sh Shirley's relatives co were called Raycraft, R-E-Y Craft, and they lived on that Fenton Road. They were digging um, trenches across the land because it was boggy land and it needed to be drained so you could grow crops. So they were draining the land into the Thames River. And um, when they were digging, they found some bones and teeth. So um, Mr. Raycraft took a bunch of bones and teeth to the Agricultural Society uh, uh, for that one day show that they have and put, showed it off there. And the local newspaper thought it was interesting, put it in there and the, the news spread right up to um, another person that was interested in this sort of thing was um, Mr. Do Mr. Jelly um, and Mr. Hillhouse. Hill and they lived in, up in a place called Jelly's Corners. This is what the, the 
Highgate Mastodon eventually looked like. When we looked online, we found there were many different things say, talking about the Highgate Mastodon. This one, in the spring of 1890, William Regcraft, no, it was William Raycraft, found some bones while digging on, on his uncle's farm. So uh, he was uh, contacted by William Hillhouse and John Jelly. Uh, they had found mammoth bones up near Shelburne. And uh, they were interested in having a look at this. So when they came in and had a look, um, they said, suggested that um, they would uh, like to uh, mine the, the bones and uh, perhaps $25 would do the trick. So that was a lot of money in those days. At least that's what he thought. So he took, took them up on that. Uh, Mr. Hillhouse and Jelly uh, dug up the bones and um, they got nearly the whole uh, skeleton, except for one tusk. When uh, Mr. Mr. Raycraft saw what had, what had they dug up, he, he asked what it would cost to renege on the offer and, uh, and have it back. Not $25, no. Th th he said $3,000 wouldn't do the job. So um, he was kind of sad and they, the two, uh, the, Mr. Heelhouse and Mr. Jelly took them back to uh, Shelburne. One of the other things you could find online was this Dakota date book from 2004. And in the bones uh, of the shoulder blade, there was a hole and in there, there was some pollen grains and uh, they found pollen of different things that were living at the time when the mast mammoth, sorry, mastodon was, was uh, when died, uh, tamarack, birch, ash, oak, elm, ironwood, butter, butternut, and 56, 156 grains of spruce pollen. This job was done at the Royal Ontario Museum. Okay, so the bones were taken back to Shelburne and they came from Highgate. Here is Jelly's Corners. It, yes, it used to be called Jelly's Corners, but uh, Mr. Jelly didn't like the idea of it being called Jelly's Corners, so they, they changed it to Shelburne. Uh, my wife's eye doctor is called Dr. Jelly in, in Kitchener, and he is a relative of the Jellies from Shelburne. So it's a small world when you get right down to it. Mr. Jelly had found the Shelburne mammoth or the Amar uh, Amaranth mammoth, and he used to take it on tour uh, to um, uh, summer and fall fairs. And this, he's standing on the piano stool there in among all the bones. And this is the field where the bones were found. Where exactly, I have no idea, but uh, Paul was sure this is the spot. Mr. Jelly also um, rounded up some friends and they made Mr. Jelly's Mastodon band and they went along with the bones to different fairs and I, can, I think he made a little bit of money on the side. This is Mr. Jelly's house in Shelburne and it has a a sign out the front, House of Jelly, built in 1891. At the back of the house, there's this big fancy garage and there used to be a little hut at this spot. When they were pulling the hut apart, they found a rib belonging to probably the, the, the um, 
the Shelburne Mammoth. Uh, it's now in, in the local museum. That's Paul Carroll checking it out. So when they had taken the bones and put, put them back together again and repaired them, as they were collecting them and taking them away, uh, somebody picked up the beautiful uh, tusk that was complete and he dropped it on the ground so they had to stick it back together again. They used hot white glue to stick all the bones together and, and, and consolidate them. So they took them different places to uh, put them on display. Uh, the, it was taken to London, Ontario, the London Free Press. Um, the shoulder blade was as large as a number nine stove lid. Now, I've no idea how big that is. It must be impressive. So the bones were taken around Southern Ontario and then later, Mr. Essery, um, he was hired to take them on tour for $50 a, a month. And um, they, they would travel across Canada and into the United States, making money as a special event in different places. Well, when you're hiring somebody to do a job like that, you have to check on their health occasionally because Mr. Essery was out in a place called Edmonton and uh, he died of typhoid fever. His friends were, who were helping him with it managed to bring the bones back to uh, Minneapolis and they put them in the storage locker at the Bib Broom Corn Company in Minneapolis and they left them there. Now, if you leave them there too long, they need some money. So what happened to the bones then was a train came by and a friend of the person in charge of the, uh, of the storage said, I've got a deal for you. There's all these bones that have been going on tour all across the region uh, and uh, you might want to buy them and take, take them and uh, make more money on, on tour. So he said, yeah, I'll do that. So I think he, he just had to pay uh, whatever the storage cost was. And luckily he was um, uh, involved with the railway and was to, able to put them on the train and take them back west uh, to where his family lived. And they were, their bones went on tour. Uh, Mr. Jolly and Mr. Hillhouse uh, were uh, worried that the, the bones sort of disappeared. They didn't know what had happened to them. One of their relatives wrote to them from out west and said, yes, that, those things are on, on display um, in communities nearby, but uh, your people aren't with them at all. So they sent letters that, that a lawyer should be got on the job and see if they can get the bones back. Uh, rumor had it that these lawyers were coming, so they sold on the bones to somebody else and eventually uh, they got uh, put into storage. They were, uh, they were sold to the University of, of, of uh, North Dakota for a hundred dollars and then they were put into storage for a number of years. So they went all the way out there to Bismarck, North Dakota, as you can see where that is. So what happened then, the, uh, the North Dakota Heritage Center uh, was wanting to have a special display and redo the front entranceway to the museum. And they thought perhaps an ice age creature like a mammoth or a saber tooth tiger or something like that, something big uh, would be neat to have right there. One of the people who was involved with the, uh, the museum 
and the, sorry, the university said, um, we have the Highgate Mastodon stored in, the, in a few boxes. Are you interested in having that? So John Hoganson said, yes, let's do that. So they rounded up the bones and they put them together and they're now on display in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota. This is what they look like um, put together. We, we sort of got involved with um, trying to find more information about this stuff. And uh, we, try, we got the record newspaper involved, the Kitchener Waterloo record newspaper involved. And uh, it so happened the day I went to talk to um, Shirley Fenton about the bones, that was the same day I had uh, a journalist from the, uh, from the record come. So uh, he uh, came with me and we had a look at the bones and um, he thought that that would be a good thing to, uh, to talk about rather than the dinosaurs in my museum, which we were originally going to uh, put a special um, article about in the, muse in, the, uh, in the newspaper. It was Colin Hunter that was the record um, newspaper man. So we decided we would go down to uh, see the area where uh, the bones were found um, in the springtime before a lot of corn and other crops come along because you can see what the gravel and the sand and other evidence is on site. So we ended up going to Lyle Clark's uh, farm, which is not far from Highgate, and he had us meet about 11 o'clock in the morning. Well, if you know, if you're going to uh, a farm like that early, about that time, in time for lunch, then the lady of the house has been busy making soup and fresh bread and things like that. And a finishing, of course, with uh, maple syrup and ice cream. So that was just great. This is their, their garden and the beautiful, uh, flowers outside. Here's Lyle Clark and he thought he knew exactly where the bones were found. So the, he's got his map and his, um, his pen handy. And Chris Gillard is a professor at um, Ridgetown Agricultural College that's involved with uh, Guelph, University of Guelph. So uh, he showed me also uh, pictures taken at the Highgate Fall Fair. So the Highgate Fall Fair has a, has a parade and it goes round twice because it's such a small place. Uh, that building in the background, there's a circle there. That is where the, uh, the bones were put on display. Um, in 1890. So these are a few places where the, the teeth that um, Shirley had may have come from. Uh, also uh, where the Highgate Mastodon was found. So from what they were saying, it could have been lot nine or lot 13 over here where the bones came from. There was another bunch of bones found over here. And we eventually found out that uh, it's either this or this was where the Highgate Mastodon came from. And the, the teeth that Shirley had were found down here. So we so these these teeth over here are now called the Fenton Mastodon teeth, and this the one over here is the Highgate Mastodon. Okay, here's Paul Carroll. He has a special thing for drilling holes in mud, and it's about and as you can see how tall it is. 
he punches a hole in the ground and every um, 10 centimeters, he pulls it out, cleans it out, pushes it down the hole until he's sitting on the top of it, turning it round. The idea was you get through all the glacial mud or sand, and he was looking for something called marl. It's a white, limey uh, clay that um, is at the bottom of ponds, Kettle Lake ponds and things like that, found in these uh, glacial environments. And there's the um, one of the drainage ditches where perhaps the bones were found. There were sand dunes. You can see in, if you go before the crops come up, you can see the sand, um, sand ridges. And um, here's Paul scraping off um, the material in his coring device and checking to see if he can find any white um, clay. He didn't manage to find any white clay. So we didn't really find where the thing was. Mammoths, sorry, mastodons roamed around this area in the winter time. Uh, they'd sometimes walk across the uh, ice and they'd fall through the ice and get uh, in the slick mud on the bottom and they'd get, they'd drown. Other times, some, um, the, the bones have been found in similar places but the, the creature was hunted by um, Paleo-Indians. And what they did, they, they took, cut the leg bone, the legs off and things like that. And then they put the, the, bo the bones and flesh in the, uh, the bog and so they could find it again in a few months time. They threw in the intestines, which floated on top of the water where the, the stash was, and then they could come and get the meat when they needed it. Somebody did um, the experiment. They, they, ha they had a, a horse and they cut it up using uh, uh, Stone Age tools. I, uh, and uh, they took out samples every so often to see how well they'd been preserved. And they, they were getting a little bit on the gross side, but they were still edible after a few months. So the, the, um, the pieces of meat were populated by um, bacteria that weren't bad for you. This is Thameswell, uh, and uh, Inside there, there are a few bones from local uh, mastodons mammoths found there. Here's a piece of a mastodon tusk. Um, here is the local people from Highgate looking at all the bones that were taken out of the ground. Uh, notice all the guys have mustaches and stuff. They all look very similar. Here is uh, Colin Hunter. He helped us put together the article in the newspaper. And his, uh, his article was uh, won the Earth Sciences Award for that year. And he got a special certificate and $1,000. So he was quite happy with that. So after we'd... Um, talked to John Hoganson out in North Dakota about our find. He wanted to know whether one of the teeth was actually one belonging to the Highgate Mastodon, which was on display at his museum, because they had to uh, make one uh, that was missing. So John came to have a look at our, our uh, tooth and measured it. And sure enough, it wasn't the one that they were missing. 
apparently when uh, they put it on display, uh, when it was moving around Southern Ontario, it got to a place called Galt and somebody stole one of their teeth there. Maybe it's still there somewhere, I don't know. Okay. Fine could be linked to Bismarck. Is all you want for Christmas is your two front teeth. A 13,000 year old mastodon got half its Christmas present already. That was the local uh, radio station that said that. Canadian University might want to hang on to its mastodon tooth. Uh, yeah, I think we should go one step at a time. Let's see if it fits. And of course it didn't fit, so we were all right. Phew. Uh, bits of news I've got into the newspapers online. So if you look up the Chicago Tribune, Sunday, June 22nd, 1890, you can find a nice article about the Highgate Mastodon. It's low, it's very uh, fine print on here, but you'll find it. A few years ago, we were putting together a display in the university about the Highgate Mastodon. So uh, Barry Warner and Paul Carroll, they were very keen on having the plant life that you might find at the time of those mammoths and mastodons roaming around. Uh, this is what it might look like, the, 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 the pine trees and uh, the kinds of flowers you find in this environment. Uh, we have um, an app for you, anybody who has a Mac. You can go to the App Store and you can find Mastodon Life, Death and Discovery. Um, that is uh, an interactive program tells you the story of the Highgate Mastodon. This is some of the illustration work from that uh, app. Here they are digging away and exposing the skull of the Highgate Mastodon. When they were digging the Highgate Mastodon up, they also found a large tusk, a large tooth of a giant beaver, which was about this big. And they didn't, didn't it didn't seem to uh, stick along with the uh, the mammoth, so we don't know what happened to that tooth, but we do know that there was one at one time. Giving talks like this to different groups, I was giving a talk at London uh, Gem Show in November a few years ago, and this lady, uh, Mrs. Dill, came and talked to us, and she had um, a bone of a mammoth from her farm at Wartburg. And um, she showed us it and then gave it to us for the museum. So, um, so that was kind of neat. Um, anybody who uh, is a fan of Fergus, Ontario, will know that Pat Meston uh, is a writer and she has some good stuff on her website about that. When they were building Fergus, um, there's a boggy area of, of ground nearby. And uh, in that boggy ground, they found some bones and teeth of a, a mammoth. And they were, they were shown around for a bit, but the person who had them decided he wanted them to go back with the rest of the bones. So, we don't know where they went. So the, where, they, where we think they came from was this boggy area where Paul is going in uh, into just now. Uh, the local Indians used to come and camp near here. Uh, they would, uh, the farmers nearby would also have trouble uh, when it was really wet and boggy, some of their uh, cattle would get stuck in the mud here, so they'd have trouble getting them out. We occasionally get other, other um, 
sites uh, suggested to us. One was the Broughton Mastodon. It was found on Highway 1 uh, near Simcoe, Ontario. And they originally found a tusk and a couple of teeth. And they know exactly where the rest of the it is on their farm, but we haven't got round uh, with COVID one thing and another to having a go and see if we can find any more stuff. So this is it. It was on Highway 1. Maybe it was, maybe it knew that was Highway 1 in Ontario. And this is where the, the bones were found, right about where that sketch is. And they were digging a trench for the water to come from that pond across the road to a field uh, where they were using it for irrigation. And those guys, the guys, the Broughtons told us exactly where the, they think the rest of it is. So sometime when COVID's out of the way, we'll go down and see if we can find the other bones. And we uh, took the Highgate Mastodon reconstruction. We put those guys and their farm all together on the same picture. In the London area, they were, there was a gravel pit and then they started making houses in the same area. And I don't think people, if they're, if they're heading for having a big house built and it's costing lots and lots of money to put those things up and they have to work to a certain time and they see these things, I think they just smash them up and keep going. This, this was a new mammoth find, that's a piece of bone. Uh, from one of these places. There are many ideas. Jacqueline Gill from the University of Wisconsin studied lake sediments from the bed of Appleman Lake, Indiana. They showed that the megafauna began dying out about 15,000 years ago and appeared to last about a thousand years. This discovery rules out one idea that the extinction might have been caused by extraterrestrial object striking the earth about 13,000 years ago. One of the uh, more popular ideas these days that, that uh, I guess McDonald's wasn't around, but megafauna meals were. And uh, the, um, the large creatures were eaten away. And uh, the one suggestion about helping with global warming now is to reconstruct some of the wetlands and uh, megafauna going back in time in, in uh, areas that we can. And that would help uh, put a balance on things again. There was a piece in the newspaper in the online um, about a week ago about that. And then, of course, you get all kinds of suggestions. 2010, woolly mammoth extinction not linked to humans. Um, in M Michigan, there are many occurrences of mammoth and mastodon bones. This is a, a small mastodon's lower jawbone and uh, very tiny. And it was found at Adams Road in Michigan. And uh, when they were putting in this uh, roundabout and where, where the roads come together, they found some bones in, as, they, as they were digging. These are a few of the bones. And it, it encouraged lots of local people to come and have a look. So the, there they are. Uh, in the middle at the bottom, you can see a piece of a tusk. And as they were digging down, um, they came to the Mali area. Can you see the, the grayish 
a whitish patch there, that is the marl. And here's a cross section of, of that site showing all the different things. They were able to get out the bones and things like that. Uh, the company that was doing the work had signed, a th um, uh, if we find it, we keep it uh, form. And uh, now that they found all this stuff, the, the scientists and people were really interested in keeping it. So who else you're going to call? Well, you call the cops in and they take pictures to make sure everything just goes right. So the bones were collected. Mud containing some of the find was taken to an area and local school kids came along and dug out pieces and they found white spruce cones uh, and they were 12,000 years old found in that material. This is what um, the area around Highgate would have looked like and it's what the area around Adams Road looked like when the Mastodons were roaming there. Okay, I'm going to call it quits there. So if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thanks a lot, Peter. So uh, that was certainly very interesting. A lot more about Mastodons and Mammoth than I did not know, but we do have some questions for you. Yeah, and then good. if uh, anyone has more questions, please um, just add them into the chat. We'll read them out for Peter. I'm going to stop sharing this. So okay, and then people. we can see your face again. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so one question we had was, do tusks go, grow throughout life? You talked about the teeth being replaced uh, six times in the... the uh... Yes, about six. You know, how about the tusks? Do they get, they don't get replaced, they but do, do they continue to grow or do they get replaced? They, they get replaced too. The top of the, oh, the sorry, the tusks don't get replaced. They don't get replaced. So the lower jaw tusk on a mastodon, uh, you wear them out and then that's it. Uh, they don't come back again once you've worn them out. So and you the talked about them. Your, your yeah, tusk. You yeah, you talked about them growing like ice cream cones lined up. So they're not continually, like beaver teeth, they're not continually growing. The tusks they make a size growing, and then they're done. They continue growing yearly. So they do. Yeah. Yes. So um, if you have, if you have well-preserved tusk of a mammoth or a mastodon, you should be able to count the rings. But if they're worn a little bit at the end or something like that, then you won't be able to tell how many really how many they are. You have to cut right down the middle and uh, count the rings, yes. And then uh, we have a question, were spruce trees growing in the north? And they were wondering why they were not foreign, found north of Barry. So why, why was there um, not Mastodons north of Barry? There, there's some, there's two strange ones way far north. Uh, the, on, our, on our collection, somebody found them in north, near Hudson Bay. So um, we don't find them further north than Barry or something like that. And then we find them way far north. So I think the question was why, why would there not the question was they would have, would have thought that spruce trees would have been growing north of Barrie, but maybe they weren't back in Mastodon days? Um, well, we found that, well, it's that uh, same line that goes through uh, Michigan, north of that line, they weren't able to uh, survive. It was still pretty cold up there. Uh, we have another question. I've seen reports that mastodons lasted much longer in Siberia. Can you tell us how late the last mastodons lasted? So how long, long were we, oh, did they, we have mastodons lasted, in Ontario? The last, the, what happened in North America is mammoths and mastodons came over and say, and weak humans came over at the same time. We wiped them out and then another batch came over uh, the same area. And so they came over twice 
over the Bering Straits area. So, and I think maybe the question was, do you know approximately how long ago the last mastodons were in Southern Ontario? About uh, 12,000 years ago in Southern Ontario. Um, they were much younger up in the Bering Straits area. Uh, they, they, uh, they found them at the, the same time as the pyramids were being, being formed, being uh, built. Uh, they were living up further north. Of course, they were, they were kind of smaller too. So I think this question may be addressed just towards the end, but uh, John is asking, were the mastodons and mammoths hunted out? Is that one of the current theories? Were they? Hunted out. Was that their extinction due to hunting? They were hunted, and one thought is that they were hunted to extinction, yes. Mind you, we don't really, you know, we do know that they were hunted and that, that they used to preserve them in lakes and one thing and another like that. Uh, yes, we, we think that that's what happened. Okay. And um, we've got a question, since you can date um, mastodons with your tusks, how old did the uh, average mastodon live? Similar to an elephant, 100 years or something like that. Some, some elephants last about that, that, that low, that's old. And another question is- the, uh, you... the, the, Sorry, the uh, Highgate Mastodon was not that old, it was middle-aged. So did they, did they actually date the age of the Highgate? They, 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 um, they, 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 they date, they date the, the area where it's found you mean, did they date how old it is from the tusk? Yeah. The answer, I'm not sure on that one. I don't know because the, you have to uh, uh, you have to take the uh, and and cut the thing in uh, in two, or you have to count the bumps. And if you put two thick layers of glue on there to hold it together, that isn't very easy. So you have to have enough of them. Some places you find a whole bunch of mammoths or mastodons in one spot. Then you can sacrifice the whole tusk and, and count through, yes. So, and the question is, do you think there are other finds not already found in Ontario? Oh, definitely. Uh, there's a lot of boggy areas uh, that could be drained for housing and one thing and another. People just have to keep an eye open. Um, that uh, people like, like uh, the dill mass, the dill mammoth bone that we were do, the lady donated to us, that was found in a boggy area of ground on her farm, and the boggy area was where they used to put all their rocks. Rocks seem to grow on farmland over the winter, so you pick them up and you drop them into this boggy area and get rid of them. Well, when they dug a hole to put the rocks, out came the bone. So the, yes, there could still be more bone there and there must be lots more places in Southern Ontario where you can find them. In that mastodons and mammoths lived at the same time, did the mastodons and mammoth compete with each other for resources, territory, food? Uh, they were after different food items. So the mastodons ate spruce trees and the ma uh, mammoths didn't like those sort of things. So they lived in different places. Uh, the mammoths uh, like grassland and stuff like that. And Susan is asking, do you think there's any chance of getting the Highgate mastodon to come back to Ontario? Uh, no is the answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> it seems very definite. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've talked to them about it. And actually, the fun thing to do is to go there and have a look at it. It's kind of a fun, fun thing to do. I, and it, oh, I have know of people who have done that, gone out there, have a look. <laughs> yeah. Is there any evidence that the ancient people of the far north hunted the mastodons and mammoths? 
expect the answer to that is. I think the answer is no. Okay. No. I think there would be too much ice in that. It would be too cold. It would be much colder than today. You know, the the ice was moving. No, you know, uh, twelve thousand years ago there was much thicker ice up north. You know, than there is now. And um, we have a question about citizen science. Are there ongoing searches by scientists or citizen science to do digs or to actively look for mastodons in Southern Ontario? Uh, scientists are still wanting more stuff, but it's kind of hard sometimes. Like one of a professor at Western University had a phone call one day and somebody was putting a farm in and they'd found one of these mam mammoth tusks or something, a mastodon tusk. Uh, they put it through a, a machine that chewed it up into small pieces. So then they had to go and rescue some small pieces and do some tests on it. But yes, it was a, a mastodon occurrence. But of course, obviously, if it's all chewed up, it's kind of hard work to do anything about. Uh, they're expensive to um, to work on. They're well worth uh, keeping an eye open, you know, for them and that kind of thing. But um, when we were putting in uh, drainage tiles in in uh, fields, they used to put actual. They used to use to dig a trench. One of the uh, at the university and the museum, we used to have a a tusk. And it was found in a trench like that. So you're putting in drainage ditch, dra drainage trench. And um, the, this thing looked like a log across the, um, across the trench they were putting in to put tile. And it wasn't, it was, it was yeah, it was a, a mammoth uh, tusk. So that was kind of fun. But nowadays, what do we do? We kind of drill a hole sideways and it can drill through anything. So if you've got a, a tusk right there, it will just drill right through it and keep going. And then you put a plastic tube in. So you, you don't physically have the evidence, right? It just, that's the way it's done these days. So it's luck. And um, keeping an eye on the local um, boggy areas, are they going to start working on draining one and building in that area? You know, when they're talking about uh, putting this 413 road through and it's got, uh, what is it, 200 wetlands through, through that area? Those would be good places to look for a mammoth or a mastodon, mainly mammoth in that area, I would think. Although we're all hoping they don't put that road in. Yeah, but they're all, mis they're all uh, Mr. Ford's friends, aren't they? So I have a question. Uh, the Kentucky coffee tree has very really large, difficult to germinate seeds and is, doesn't uh, reproduce in the wild very well anymore. And it's thought that in the past, they, the seeds actually passed through mastodon guts before germination. When I was looking at that range, Macedon range in Ontario, although I guess it coincides with the cedar or the, uh, the spruce tree range, do you know, would that also be similar to the Kentucky coffee tree range? And do we know if Macedon's actually ate a lot of Kentucky coffee tree? I'm not sure, but I, I, would, I would have suggested that, yeah, some of those things would have been eaten by these thing, these creatures, yeah. So they, they, they need a bit of wear and tear before they'll actually grow the yeah, seed. There, yeah, Guelph did an interesting experiment a couple of years ago where they, uh, so to, to get Kentucky coffee tree seeds to germinate, you have to file them and soak them in acid and do all this other stuff to, to make them germinate. And uh, they had the idea they were going to, they fed a bunch of the trees or the seeds to the elephants at the African lion safari. Oh, um, thinking that that would be similar to, you know, putting them through a mastodon. And I then they've, um, I don't think they've got the results out yet, but then they were going to see if the seeds that went through the elephants uh, 
you know, germinate it better than the seeds that didn't go through elephants. And I don't know if they've published that yet, but some poor grad student had to, you know, get the elephant dung and then sort through it to pull out the seeds and, <laughs> and then plant them. Sounds so, interesting. But when I, I was looking, because the Kentucky coffee tree is a Carolinian species and it, it was kind of the same zone um, where the Macedons were and certainly um, in that area where Highgate is. Oh, I think, I think it's a good chance that they ate those sorts of things, definitely. So I think we've come to the end of the questions that I see posted, unless anybody has any more. I don't see them coming up. So thanks for that interesting talk. At the Welcome. University of uh, Waterloo Museum, can we actually see these teeth still? You can when it opens. Right now it's not open. In the fall, I think they're going to have things open so you can actually go through and have a look at it. You can go on the website and have a look at things, um, but it's not the same as actually seeing the things in the museum. So uh, you'll have to watch when, it, when it's open again. Okay, so I'm seeing some thank yous come and I'm gonna extend my thanks to you for a very interesting talk. And um, when COVID allows us to go through, I'm sure some of us will be making the trip to at least the University of Waterloo to look at those teeth, but maybe not all the way over to North Dakota to see the entire animal. Well, if you want to arrange a special tour or something, once things are good, I don't mind doing that at that time. Okay, well, that's a great offer. Okay. So, uh, thanks all, and uh, we'll see you again uh, next month. So thanks again, Peter. It was great. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Roger.